Hi, welcome to a new episode, in the Internet Surfer, hosting the most horror, and creepiest stories, from Reddit. Please, don't forget, to comment, like, share, and subscribe. Enjoy! What's a crazy story you've wanted to tell but there's never been a thread specific enough for it? Episode 1 I'm a doctor. I've been practicing for around 12 years now. My years as a junior doctor in the hospital system were pretty wild. Picture a bunch of bright and frequently eccentric guys and gals in their mid-twenties, working high-stress jobs, with much sleep deprivation. Sort of like, scrubs, but with more casual fun and drug use. One thing that is rife is pranks, especially on junior doctors. This is a story of the best prank I ever heard of, played by a surgeon buddy of mine, who we shall call J, on an intern, who shall call L, not their real initials. J is sitting in the on-call room on a night shift, surfing the net at 2 a.m. He gets a page from L who is asking for some help. L has been asked by the nurses on the ward to declare someone deceased. They were old and unwell, and their death was expected, and it is a legal obligation that a medical officer declare a deceased person to be dead, and sign their death certificate. L has never done this before, and asks how it is done. J explains that you check for a pulse, and then listen to the chest to confirm the absence of heart sounds and breathing. So far, correct. Then, in order to confirm brainstem death, you shine a torch in their eyes to demonstrate that the pupils are fixed and dilated, correct, and perform a quick rectal examination to demonstrate the absence of anal sphincter tone, very much not correct. L is suspicious. He asks J if he is sure. J explains that it all sounds a bit odd, but that it is standard procedure. L says okay, and hangs up, but is still dubious. So he pages the on-call medical registrar to double-check these facts. Unfortunately, the medical registrar has been sitting next to Jay the whole time and heard the entire conversation. He confirms to L that yes, it seems a bit much, but that this is the standard procedure for declaring a patient to be deceased. L goes off to the patient's room, checks for a pulse, listens to the chest, shines a pen torch into his eye, then rolls the corpse over, slips on some gloves, lubes up with KY, and sticks his finger up his arse. Better yet, neither J nor the medical rig saw fit to tell L they were pranking him. The poor kid spent the best part of the next two months rectally violating every dead person in the hospital he was asked to certify. I don't know how long it would have gone on for if a nurse hadn't walked in one time while he was doing it and asked him what the hell he was doing. Fortunately, she didn't report him and no one else ever found out, but the tale went down in junior doctor legend at my hospital. I'm just glad no relatives ever caught him doing it, poor kid might have been deregistered. I went to Europe in the summer of 2008 with some people and teachers from my high school on one of those EF tours with the bright orange backups. If you've ever gone on an EF tour then you know that backpack, it screams, I'm a tourist. Anyway, we're about halfway through the trip and we're in Venice, Italy. We had four or so hours to go off on our own and explore the city and so my friends and I go do some exploring. They found a museum they wanted to go to, but my grandma, whom had given me a good portion of the money to go on this trip, really wanted rosary beads from a specific church in Venice. So I go off, alone, to find this church and these rosary beads. It doesn't take long before I realize I'm lost. I have a map but it's in Italian and I don't know which way is north. The moment when I realized I was in deep shit was when two thugs selling knockoff designer handbags started following me. The part of the city I found myself in was suddenly less touristy and there was graffiti and other signs I was not in a good part of town. And this is where that backpack comes in. It's bright orange and practically screams, I'm lost come take all my money. Then I could feel someone right behind me. I turn around and it was one of the men who were following me. He asked me if I was lost, 
I lied and told him I wasn't but he knew I was lying. I began furiously thinking about how I was going to get out of this situation and decided that maybe if I bought one of his handbags, knowing he'd overcharge me, maybe he wouldn't take all my belongings and I could ask for directions. So I ask him how much for a handbag and he says, about tree fitty. Well it was about this time that I noticed this street thug was actually three stories tall and a crustacean from the Paleolithic era. I said, God damn Loch Ness Monster. I am not giving you a tree fitty. I ran away and somehow found my way back to my group. I didn't tell anyone about it, until now. My first year of college, kind of lonely, because now I'm 18 and still never had a boyfriend. I was photography major taking random photos with my chunky DSLR when I noticed a group of hot guys tossing around a football across from me. One hot one came over and introduced himself to me, and I quickly knew where this was going. Then he said, my friend over there thinks you're cute. The one in the white shirt. I saw a guy in a white shirt, and he was almost a midget. He had to be like 4 feet 11 inches with short arms and legs. According to the internet, a midget is legally an inch shorter. Anyway, I didn't want to laugh and turn him down so we became friends. I even snapped a photo of him. One day I had no classes for three hours, and it was pouring outside so everyone was inside with nowhere to sit. He said his house was a few minutes away, and that his aunt was home, so we can go there. I hesitated a lot, but hey, why not? His house was half an hour away and in the middle of Farmville, completely secluded in the woods. With it being dark and rainy, I felt this was a sign. We got there and he lied. Nobody was home. Red flag number one. I put my backpack down and I noticed pictures of him wrangling baby cows and shit. I asked him what that was and apparently he's a cowboy in competitions. He was a midget cowboy, literally the most random thing ever. Then while watching TV on the sofa, he popped a chicken nugget boner and then tried to pull a move on me to force fun upon me. He was trying to wrangle me. After some struggle, I jumped off the couch and pulled out my handy dandy box cutter for situations like this, you know, a midget cowboy trying to dape you. I told him to drive me back to school or else I'll stab him. He dropped me off and drove off. Apparently his friend said that he uses his shortness to pick up chicks and usually they pity him. I still have that photo on my camera. When my friends don't believe the fact that he was a midget I show them. I still keep that box cutter with me wherever I go. We're on tour in the South. Pick a state, any state. In the context of the story it really doesn't matter. So there's this woman and her friend who have been following the band show to show over several states. This isn't all that unusual, plenty of fans do it. But she also has her 15-year-old daughter with her. Now these folks are dyed in the wool, born and bred, 100%, double-wide living, trailer park trash. Okay. Nothing wrong with that either. Most of the time. The hotel we're at is right across the street from the venue. So we're at the hotel waiting for production to be ready for us to sound check. I'm kind of hanging out in the drum tech S room and one of my guitar players is in a room across the hall. Everyone's doors are open. This woman and her daughter are in the room talking to him, and I just think, okay, whatever. At least I don't have to talk to them. So I go downstairs to the indoor pool where the soda machines are, and there is this hot girl getting one. She sees me, the clothes, the hair. Doesn't take her long to put two and two together. Conversation strikes up, and in about three sentences I have her and the conversation moving towards my room and some rocking bopping. But there's a hitch, she's married, and her husband is back in their room. Well. The breaks go on, and we just stand in the hallway and talk about it how it's too bad we can't do it, because it would be awesome, and that's the end of that. I get back upstairs, and the 15-year-old girl is in my guitar player's room with him alone. Now, he's not the kind of guy to mess with anyone under the age of 18, he's got two daughters, 
and where his morals can be somewhat questionable at times, this is not his speed. However, he also has a substance abuse problem. And create the right circumstances, and get him in the right condition, and shit could happen. So I go down the hall and tell my production manager what's happening. He and I both know at this moment what is happening. It's a setup. So my PM says hate this, and goes down to the room, walks in, grabs the girl by the arm, says, okay, we're done here. This isn't going to happen. Out. Go find your mom. I leave the room because I can tell by the way my PM looks at me that he's about to have a little chat with my guitar player, and that I might not want to be there. My PM is one of my best friends in the world. But I'm still scared of him. So I leave. I find the girl and her mother out in back of the venue by the buses, standing with some of the crew. I walk up to them, and they're chatting away like everything in the world is sparkly and blue, and that she didn't try to just pimp her 15-year-old daughter out so that she could get put on guest lists and passes for the next however long. At this point I'm thinking it might just be best if I disappear the mother down one of the many mine shafts the state has to offer. Her daughter is smoking a cigarette, and I reach out and take it out of her mouth, and without missing a beat, look at her mom and say, you're a horrible mother. Didn't really see them too much after that. Not really the craziest, but this my absolute favorite story in the world and it's 100% true. I've got three cousins who are birth siblings and were adopted by my aunt and uncle 20 some odd years ago. The oldest boy was maybe 6 at the time and the two younger sisters were maybe 3 and 4. They had just moved in and my aunt and uncle wanted to introduce them to some kids in the neighborhood from the Cook family down the street, so they set up a dinner date on the calendar. The oldest is just learning how to read and is the newest to the house. So he gets his sisters to pack their toys and they get caught trying to sneak out of the house. My aunt, who at this point is still a strange old lady these kids just moved in with, asks them why they're leaving, and the oldest asks her why does the calendar say, cook kids for dinner. I can't imagine the fear six-year-old me would have felt if my new mom had that written on her calendar, but the story is just so damn cute for some reason. When I worked at the Salvation Army, we had a regular called Teresa, a bearded man who wore pink tutus and would come in every day to see if we have Barbie dolls. One day, he came in very anxiously and asked for a razor. I told him we didn't have one, and he started twitching and saying, I need a razor. Stop hiding them. Just give me a razor. But with more cursing. When I tried to direct him to another store, he exploded and yelled, I have a disease growing on my face. I am a woman. This beard is a disease on my face. You don't understand. You don't have a disease on your face. I need a razor. At this point, an elderly Italian woman ran over and yelled at him in that Italian gibberish that only they can do, and he freaked out and bailed out. He came back the next day, back on his meds, and still had a beard. A few years ago, I was promoted to a management position within the software company I work for. I was told I was handpicked for the job and, though it was a big promotion, I would not receive a pay increase until I had the team performing at minimum required performance standards. Two years in, I had the team running the best numbers it had ever seen, far exceeding the minimum standards. Every quarter, I asked to be reviewed for a raise and every quarter a reason was found to skip the review. Finally, I brought HR into the mix because, I'm nailing this and busting me over here. Miraculously, a date was set for the end of the month. Funny how that works out. Alas, a week before my review date, where I would surely be granted my rate increase, my direct supervisor, a micromanaging weasel of a man, and the CEO of the company, rewrote the minimum requirements to just barely exceed my team's current projected stats. When I came to him, fists clenched, he explained this move as an unrelated adjustment to compensate for improved average performance. Totally. Legit. Of course, 
with this change in place a week later, he took the opportunity with the HR director in attendance, to express his deep and profound disappointment with my performance and to warn me that he expected me to go the extra mile next quarter or face disciplinary action since my team had failed to make the new grade. I was angry. So angry. I wanted to complain but, hey, it's the CEO. Who am I going to complain to? He knew that too and sneered at me any time he could. That's why I worked even harder, neglected my family and personal health, and worked to drive my team to their limits. We made it too. I was going to show that stain he couldn't win. Unless he cheated. When it became apparent that he was going to be forced to eat the pile of shit he shoveled to me in the previous meeting with HR in attendance, he called me into a meeting to design a training handout for the team. We bounced ideas back and forth but something was weird. Every time I tried to assign a task to someone or set a due date on the handout, the CEO dodged it. By the end of the meeting, we had accomplished nothing solid and he tabled the assignment for a later date. Because it was tabled and I assumed we would reschedule a follow-up, I filed my notes away and moved on with other work. A month after that planning meeting, I was pulled into HR and written up for failing to issue the training handout we had tabled. The CEO was in attendance and brought his personally typed meeting notes clearly outlining that I was assigned the task that day. I had no recourse. He was lying. I said as much and was treated like a combative child. He acted insulted and incredulous. By the end, I was sent home for the day with a demotion off of the team I had built and worked so hard for. I still don't know why the CEO had it out for me. He hired in his assistant manager to replace me and told everyone he could how bad I did in that position. I'll never be chosen for something like that again because this decided he didn't like me. That's it. No revenge. No justice. The bad guy wins. Maybe one day he'll die in a fiery car crash. One can only hope. When my best friend came out to me, before I could say anything, I projectile vomited. Not once, but twice. Right after she said the words, I'm gay. Luckily it didn't land on her, but it was pretty messy. She assumed this was me showing my disapproval, ran out of my house crying and went home. So here I am, with an upset best friend who thinks I don't love her anymore because she's gay, covered in my own vomit which is also covering my kitchen floor, and enough nausea to take down a horse. Not to mention horrific guilt for upsetting my friend. I cleaned myself and kitchen floor up and attempted to call her, no answer. I took some nausea medication and took a nap to see if the nausea would subside. I wake up 12 hours later, and you guessed it, covered in my own vomit. Again. I went to the doctor and apparently had a really severe stomach virus, she prescribed me some meds and I was fine. I called my best friend again, and she finally answered. I explained to her that I was totally fine with her being gay, and was 100% supportive of her. I explained the stomach virus situation and told her I had directions on how to take care of myself to prove it. Two years later we're still best friends, and now we love to laugh about my projectile vomiting. I was baked and singing karaoke when a fight broke out. I had sung karaoke before but only a handful of times. I also chose songs that were more talking with style than actual singing. All through my first song, we didn't start the fire, the little thing that bobs along to the words was like half a beat off so I was second guessing myself the whole time. In spite of that, I decided I would do actual singing. I submitted round here by the Counting Crows. First off, not a good karaoke choice. Not very upbeat or well-known enough to make up for that. Second, I was baked. Had never been in that state while singing to a room full of people. Third, the bar was a shithole. I have a theory that bars only allow karaoke when their balls are an inch from the band saw. It's a last-ditch effort to remain solvent. So I'm up there, emoting, she wants to meet a boy who looks like Elvis, 
when I hear this smash. Some lady broke a beer mug over some guy's head. They're rolling around on the floor like 10 feet away from me. I have no idea what to do. So I keep singing. More people jump on the dog pile, trying to separate the two. There's like 10 people in there. And through it all I'm just tenderly serenading the bar with this song. This goes on for a while. Screaming, feeble and desperate attempts to swing at each other with people trying to hold them back and me trying my best to keep it together. The DJ cuts me off right at the good part, very late. Turns out he was also the bouncer and was one of the first to dive right in. He asks if I want to start over. I say no. How are you supposed to top that? I'm at an observation post, OP. I'm observing my sector. In my sector, some Afghan National Army, ANA, soldiers have started constructing their own OP on a hilltop. They decide to park some vehicles on this hilltop, one of which is a truck carrying their entire local supply of mortar rounds. Upon parking, the vehicles take enemy RPGs, and the mortar truck is hit, causing a fire. The occupants do not get out. The fire spreads to the cargo, which cooks off the mortar rounds. There is a large fiery explosion, followed by what looks like rockets flying out of the truck in random directions, some of them striking the other nearby ANA VIX. It is like a fireworks show gone bad. The truck and another Humvee are now smoking wrecks and I would later find out the truck occupants were burned alive. The people who worked in the offices were heard joking about this incident, causing us to hate POGs even more. This happened when I was about 13 or 14, I was at my friend's house and her grandma called me into the living room where there was a fairly large picture window overlooking the house across the street which happened to be the house of our other friend. So I go in the living room and her grandma is looking out the window telling me to hurry up and come over. So I go over and there is a red car stopped in front of the driveway across the street. A guy gets out, opens up the trunk of his car, takes out a plastic bag, and dumps it in their bushes. He then gets in his car and speeds away. By this time, I grab my friend and we texted the girl across the street to come and check out what the guy dropped. So all four of us go to the bush and see the bag. My friend's grandma grabbed a stick and poked around in the bag and opens it up and inside is a needle and heroin. Her grandma was a nurse at the time so she held the bag with the stick and we all went back inside and her grandma called the cops. While we were waiting for the cops to come we were in the living room and we see the same red car pull up. The same guy gets out and walks over to the bush. When he sees that the bag is missing, he freaks out. He's like pulling his hair out and running around the bush trying to find his bag. Finally he leaves and the cops come and ask what's up so we told them everything that we saw. He takes the bag and proceeds to tell us that this is the third heroin drop in this area in the past week. And I was a part of all of this because my friend's grandma was a huge people watcher and just liked to creep on people. Crazy day. Alright, about a decade ago we're fresh out of high school and dumb teenagers. Across the street from my boyfriend's apartment there's a shopping center with a few abandoned shops and a functioning office max. One of those abandoned stores used to be a hardware store, so it's huge, and it's been empty for a long time. One day my boyfriend decides he wants to explore the abandoned hardware store. I, being the goody two-shoes pussy I still am to this day, refused to join and tried to talk him out of it. Unfortunately he had two dumbass friends who were also really into the idea of doing this. That evening after the office max had shut down and all the cars had left the parking lot the three of them head over on foot with a crowbar and a video camera. This is how I got to see what happened. They were dicking around on the walk there, acting like ninjas slash spies, you know dumb teenager things. They finally get to one of the doors and attempt to pry it open. After a long time of no success they finally make the door budge and an alarm starts screaming. They gun it and escape unnoticed and that's where the story originally ended. 
Several months later due to unfortunate circumstances, boyfriend now has a job at that office Max. One day he's making rounds with a co-worker when he points at a door and asks where that leads to. Turns out that door is a back way to the parking lot that stays locked and no one ever uses. Coworker then talks about how once recently someone tried to break in and set off the alarm, and every time the alarm goes off the GM has to come to the store immediately to file a police report. That evening he was there for several hours and had to come back to open in the morning. An Asian guy came into Target on Black Friday. He asked for an iPad, any kind. So I grabbed him one. My coworker Brad walks by with a crate of iPads. The Asian fellow asks for the entire crate. He wanted as many iPads as we could give him. Our AP guy wasn't there and the manager said there was no limit, so I ended up selling him roughly $10,000 worth of iPads. Each came with a gift card for Target relative to their price. The $500 had a $140 gift card and so on. He ended up paying $9,500 of them with gift cards he already had. Only spending $500 or so on them while getting a ridiculous amount of gift cards back. Thanks for watching. Please comment, like, share and subscribe. The Internet Surfer on YouTube for more horror and scary stories.